Good morning. My name is Debbie Herzman, and it's my privilege to serve as the chairman of the National Transportation Safety Board. I would like to take a moment to introduce my colleagues, Vice Chairman Chris Hart and Member Robert Sumwalt. Welcome to the boardroom of the National Transportation Safety Board. Under the 1976 Government in the Sunshine Act, multi-member federal agencies conduct much of their business in open session. Therefore, board meetings are often called sunshine meetings. While the public is invited to observe the meeting, only the board members and our staff will participate in today's discussions. A few weeks ago, the NTSB staff submitted the following report for the board's consideration. Notation 7954B, Safety Study, Introduction of Glass Cockpit Avionics into Light Aircraft. The board members have had the intervening weeks to study these documents. While we might have met with staff individually, today is the first opportunity for all of the board members to meet together to discuss the issues contained in this report. During this meeting, the board members will hear staff presentations addressing the primary issues identified in the safety study. We will be soliciting staff comments and explanations on many points. Once we have discussed the draft study, we will then consider the conclusions and the specific recommendations proposed by the staff. Sometimes all or part of a conclusion or recommendation is revised or rejected by the board members. This is because these are our actual deliberations over these documents. That is the purpose of the Sunshine Act, to provide the public a window into our decision making. Approximately 30 minutes after this meeting, copies of the abstracts containing conclusions and recommendations approved by the board can be obtained from our public affairs office and will be placed on our website. Before we begin, I'd like to extend our appreciation to those outside of the agency who helped facilitate this study. This includes the Federal Aviation Administration, who provided the aircraft activity and usage data, which were an integral component of our study, and the general aviation aircraft manufacturers who provided critical aircraft and equipment information and welcomed our staff on site to observe factory transition training. Without their support and access to their information, we would not have been able to complete this study. I'd like to say a few words about glass cockpit technology that is the subject of this study. In less than a decade, cockpits of new general aviation aircraft have transitioned from conventional analog flight instruments to digital-based electronic displays, commonly referred to as glass cockpits. Unlike traditional cockpits with mechanical gauges, glass cockpits use computer displays that the pilot can adjust to display different flight information. Just last week, I had the opportunity to see this new technology up close while sitting in the right seat of a single engine airplane equipped with a glass cockpit system. It was operated by the local Civil Air Patrol and piloted by our own Dr. Paul Shuda. It was an excellent opportunity for me to see this technology in action. Although on the outside of the aircraft, it looked very much like the type of airplane that I took flying lessons in over 20 years ago, I can tell you that inside, it looked much more like a modern jet. The left screen was the primary flight display and the right was the multifunction display. Together, these components provide a wealth of information that just isn't available or as readily accessible to pilots in conventional light aircraft. I saw the functionality of the flight management system, visual and oral alerts for traffic, and at our fingertips, fingertips with just the touch of a button or the twist of a dial, we had up-to-date weather data, maps, and charts. When the autopilot was engaged, these light aircraft practically fly themselves and it was capable of taking advantage of precision landing aids. The enhanced function and information capabilities of glass cockpits are a significant change for the general aviation community, and this change has been rapid. As we will discuss today, in less than five years, the cockpits of most newly manufactured small piston airplanes have transitioned from, an from traditional analog to digital displays. 
the potential of these systems to bring a higher level to safety of safety to aviation is great yet with the potential safety comes an increased responsibility to ensure that the pilots who are operating these systems are adequately trained on the systems and proficient in understanding how they work. As staff will explain in a moment, that was the purpose of this study, to test the hypothesis that the transition to glass cockpit avionics and light aircraft will improve the safety of their operation and to evaluate the resources and requirements supporting this transition to this new technology. I commend our staff in research and engineering. Many divisions supported the production of this report. They developed a timely report and identified key safety issues as we transition to this new technology. And while the study is the genesis of the Safety Board's research and engineering division, and Dr. Groff in particular, it was a collaborative effort involving many of the board staff in RE and the Aviation Safety Division. Thank you to all of you who supported this study and your dedication to this product. Dr. Meyer, will you please introduce the staff and begin the presentations? Yes, ma'am, good morning. Seated to my left is Dr. Joseph Colley, who's the Director of the Office of Research and Engineering. Next to Joe is Dr. Lauren Groff, our study manager, and next to Lauren is Dr. Robert Dodd, the Chief of the Safety Research and Data Analysis Division. Seated at the far end of the second table, is Jeffrey Gazzetti, the Deputy Director for Regional Operations in our Office of Aviation Safety. To Jeff's left is Jim Cash, the Acting Deputy Director of the Office of Research and Engineering and our Chief Technical Advisor for Vehicle Recorders. To Jim's left is Dr. Vern Ellingstadt, the Chief Technical Advisor for Investigations and Research in the Office of Research and Engineering, and he is, of course, the uh, former Director of that office. To Vern's left is Jeff Marcus, Safety Recommendation Specialist, and to Jeff's left is Gary Halbert, our General Counsel, and Tom Zoller, our Executive Officer. Joe Colley has the opening presentation. Good morning, Chairman Hurstman, Vice Chairman Hart, Member Sumwalt. We are pleased to bring this study of glass cockpit avionics to the board. We are confident that the draft study report has identified issues and generated safety recommendations that will make a useful contribution to the safety of general aviation. In addition to its well-known responsibility to investigate and establish the facts, circumstances, and probable cause of individual transportation accidents, the NTSB has also been charged to conduct special studies and investigations about transportation safety. This safety research mandate often involves the analysis of collections of accidents to tease out safety issues or effects that might not be identifiable in individual accidents examined one at a time. This safety study did just that. Shortly after the introduction of glass cockpit technology into the general aviation fleet, the safety board began investigating accidents of GA airplanes with this equipment installed. As these units were sent to our laboratories for examination, and as these investigations matured, air safety investigators and laboratory staff's interest were piqued as potential safety issue areas were questioned and examined. Staff soon identified the application of glass cockpit technology to general aviation as an emerging technology issue. Further discussions led investigators to propose the topic as worthy of a detailed safety study. After initial research into the topic, a study plan was proposed. Ultimately, that proposal was approved by all board members, and in January 2008, the study began. This study is the board's initial look into the safety concerns of glass cockpit-enabled GA aircraft. It will provide the aviation community with one of the first detailed examinations of the safety implications of the introduction of this technology. Thus, its scope is deliberately limited to a few specific issues. Of course, we view this as a first step, and both the Office of Research and Engineering and Aviation Safety will continue to investigate and study additional issues as they arise. Allow me to offer a bit of background to introduce you to the topic of glass cockpit implementation. 
1937, the British Royal Air Force chose a set of six essential flight instruments that have basically defined the conventional aircraft cockpit since that time. They include an airspeed indicator, an attitude indicator, an altimeter, turn and bank indicator, a heading indicator, and a vertical speed indicator. These instruments depend on pedostatic pressure sensing devices and gyroscopes, technologies that have a very long history and have been perfected and standardized over the years. Both the look and the function of these instruments and their organization on the instrument panel were essentially the same from aircraft to aircraft, even including large commercial airplanes. Computer-driven electronic flight displays that were first developed for military application in the 60s began to replace electromechanical instruments in commercial transport aircraft in the 70s. These early displays used cathode ray tubes, which earned them the label glass cockpits. CRT technologies have, of course, been long since replaced with newer display technologies, such as liquid crystal and light-emitting diode displays. Typical light aircraft instrumentation includes a primary flight display, shown on the left, that replaces the basic aircraft control information displayed by the six basic instruments in the conventional cockpit. In addition, the glass cockpit usually includes a multifunction display, shown on the right, which can be configured to display a wide variety of information from engine condition to weather to navigational charts. Enormously more information is available to the pilot of a glass cockpit aircraft than of, the con of a conventionally equipped light aircraft. This study examines a specific group of light aircraft that were being manufactured with both conventional and glass cockpit instrumentation. The glass cockpits in each are as varied as the Bacon model. A few of the 15 models we examined are shown here. During the very short time span from 2002 to 2006, the newly manufactured light aircraft fleet in the United States has gone from essentially 100% conventional cockpit instrumentation to essentially 100% glass cockpit equipped aircraft. While a great many older aircraft continue to be flown, avionics manufacturers have been active in developing and securing certification for glass cockpit retrofits for aircraft originally delivered with conventional instruments. This unique time period presented a remarkable natural experiment during which a carefully controlled comparison could be made between new conventionally equipped and new glass cockpit equipped aircraft of comparable capability. This study could not have been done before 2002 and it could not have been done after 2006. Dr. Groff will discuss the details of this natural experiment a bit later. The study before you contains three primary sections referred to as one, the quantitative analysis, two, the qualitative analysis, and three, a case study review that seek to answer the three broad questions that you see here. The question of the relative safety of glass cockpit compared to conventionally instrumented light aircraft was statistically assessed by comparing the accident rates of the two groups of aircraft. These comparisons provide the most direct and objective evidence of the safety effect of the glass cockpit. The issues of training and oversight are addressed in the study's qualitative analysis section. This analysis focuses on the adequacy of the steps that the industry and the FAA have taken to accommodate the changes that the new technology has brought to the flying task. Finally, issues unique to the glass cockpit aircraft were documented in the case study investigation of particular accidents. Staff believes that this three-pronged approach resulted in a far better understanding of the safety issues associated with advanced light aircraft glass cockpits. The cooperation of the FAA to derive estimates of aircraft flight hours for the study aircraft was essential to the accomplishment of the quantitative analysis of this study. Similarly, 
the assistance of the General Aviation Manufacturers Association and of Cessna Aircraft Company and Cirrus Design Corporation provided essential information that supported the qualitative analysis in the study. Each of these groups also performed a technical review of the factual portions of the study. Finally, the efforts of individual air safety investigators in the Board's Office of Aviation Safety and investigators in the Vehicle Recorder Laboratory made possible the detailed assessment of individual accident cases. That concludes my brief introduction to the study. We can take any questions you have at this time and move on to Dr. Groff, who will provide a more detailed explanation of the study methodology and results. Dr. Crawley, thank you very much for that uh, presentation. I have one question for you, and I know that many people in the audience might be interested in some of the other safety studies that your staff uh, is working on, and so I thought it might be a good idea for you to just let us know what else we might anticipate seeing uh, on aviation issues. Yes. Uh, currently, we're involved in two additional safety studies that have been approved through the notation process. Uh, the first is we is looking into general aviation and the use of airbag technology in, in, the, in the general aviation fleet. Um, we're looking at the, as that technology has initially been introduced, we're looking at the effectiveness of general, uh, general aviation airbags. We're looking at, at uh, if there's any unintended consequences of the use of these uh, devices. Uh, we've launched on several accidents uh, over the past year uh, past couple of years, uh, and we're looking to wrap that study up sometime in the summer this year. Uh, our second study, we're looking at uh, uh, the human fatigue issues associated with uh, aviation, and in particular, uh, Part 135 operations. Um, staff has developed a investigation methodology process uh, and we are testing the effectiveness of that investigation process by applying it to the field as accidents in 135 operations occur. So at the conclusion of that study, uh, we will be able to first evaluate the effectiveness of the methodology and second also have something to say about human fatigue in Part 135 operations. We expect that that will probably be completed sometime next year. Thank you very much. I think that's helpful for the board members and also for uh, folks who are in the audience and might be watching just to know what things, uh, what additional things your office might pro be producing in the near term. Thank you very much and please proceed with the presentations. Good morning, Chairman Hersman, Vice Chairman Hart and Member Simwell. As Dr. Colley stated, staff conducted both quantitative and qualitative assessments to explore the safety effects of the introduction of glass cockpit avionics into light aircraft. In the following presentation, I will discuss the results of the quantitative statistical analysis portion of the study. The goals for this portion of the study were to identify any differences in the operational characteristics of conventional and glass cockpit aircraft and to determine how glass cockpit avionics have affected safety. To accomplish this, staff compared two groups of aircraft and used accident information and activity data to calculate <laughs> accident rates. The two cohorts or matched groups of aircraft included airplanes manufactured during the same time period, one equipped with glass cockpit primary flight displays or PFDs and the other with conventional instruments. The aircraft selection criteria were designed to reduce potentially misleading results due to differences in aircraft age, design, use, or other equipment changes. Staff worked with the General Aviation Manufacturers Association and its members to identify by serial number two cohorts of single engine piston airplanes manufactured during the five years from 2002 through 2006 and the cockpit equipment installed in each aircraft. For this study, glass cockpit aircraft were defined as those having a PFD. The years 2002 through 2006 were selected because they bridged the introduction of glass cockpit avionics into this group of aircraft. 
In addition, starting in 2006, the FAA changed its survey methodology used to calculate the general aviation flight activity information important to this study. By comparing manufacturer aircraft serial number data with FAA aircraft registration records, the NTSB identified more than 2,800 airplanes for the conventional cockpit display cohort and more than 5,500 for the glass cockpit cohort. That information was used to summarize the data and compare accident involvement by cockpit display type. Aircraft selected for the study included the models of single-engine piston airplanes shown here, manufactured between 2002 and 2006 by Cessna, Cirrus Design, Columbia, Diamond, Mooney, Piper, and Hawker Beechcraft. NTSB Aviation Accident Database records were used to identify study aircraft involved in accidents and to capture the details of those accidents. These data were used to make statistical comparisons between the accidents experienced by both cohorts, including severity and other details of the flight. Data were also used to identify pilot-related details, such as the number of crew members, pilot age, certification, and flight experience. A total of 266 accidents from 2002 through 2008 involving U.S. registered aircraft were identified for inclusion in the study. Of those accidents, the conventional cohort experienced 141 total and 23 fatal accidents, and the glass cockpit cohort experienced 125 total and 39 fatal accidents. The accident records provided enough data to make statistically reliable comparisons between the two groups. The distributions of accidents changed over the study period as new aircraft were being manufactured. The blue bars on this chart represent the present percentage of study aircraft each year with glass cockpits. This yellow line indicates the percentage of accidents each year involving the glass cockpit cohort. And this red line indicates the percentage of fatal accidents involving the glass cockpit cohort. If the accidents were proportionately distributed, these lines would follow the tops of the blue bars. In general, aircraft in the glass cockpit cohort showed a disproportionately lower rate of total accidents per registered aircraft over the period from 2002 through 2008, but a disproportionately higher rate of fatal accidents than those in the conventional cohort. The statistical analyses showed that the percentage of accidents resulting in fatality was about twice as high for the glass cockpit cohort as for the conventional cohort. Analyses also showed differences in accident flights that provide more insight into the differences in accident severity. For example, accidents involving glass cockpit aircraft were more likely to be associated with personal or business flights, longer flights, and instrument flights while accidents involving conventional analog cockpit aircraft were likely to be associated with instructional flights and shorter flights. Further comparison of accident details showed that higher percentages of conventional aircraft accidents occurred during ground phases like taxi, takeoff, and landing, and involved events like loss of control on ground and hard landings. In contrast, higher percentages of the glass cockpit accidents occurred during <coughs> flight phases like climb, cruise, and approach, and evolved in events like loss of control in flight, collision with terrain, and weather encounters. Accidents involving glass cockpit aircraft involve more single pilot operations with older pilots who are more likely to hold at least a private pilot certificate, more likely to hold an instrument rating, and to have more total flight hours than those flying aircraft with conventional instruments. The comparisons that I've described show a pattern of differences suggesting that the glass cockpit aircraft were used differently than the conventionally equipped aircraft. Verifying these differences required us to compare aircraft activity data. Accident comparisons based on aircraft records alone can be misleading because aircraft may be sold exported or damaged. Any differences in aircraft use can also expose one group of aircraft to different risks for severe accident outcomes. 
Staff addressed these limitations by working with the FAA to calculate targeted activity data from the FAA's annual General Aviation Air Taxi Activity and Avionics, or GATA, survey of aircraft owners. Activity and usage information was calculated by matching the study aircraft to survey responses from aircraft owners for the 2006 and 2007 surveys. GATA survey data indicated that for the 2006-2007 time period, the glass cockpit cohort flew fewer hours per aircraft on average, a higher percentage of hours for personal business flights, a lower percentage for instructional flights, and a higher percentage of hours in instrument meteorological conditions when compared to the conventional aircraft. These activity data were then compared to NTSB accident records to calculate accident rates. As this chart shows, the two-year total accident rates per 100,000 flight hours were similar for both the glass and conventional cohorts, but the fatal rate was higher for the glass cockpit aircraft. Further review of the accident rates by aircraft use found that the total accident rate was higher for conventional aircraft during both instructional and personal or business flying, while the total and fatal accident rates were higher for the glass cockpit cohort in IMC and at night. Study analyses showed that glass co cockpit aircraft experienced proportionately fewer total accidents than a comparable group of aircraft with conventional instruments. The lower rates of total accidents for glass cockpit aircraft would suggest a safety benefit, were it not for the significantly higher percentage of fatal accidents during the years 2002 through 2008 and the higher fatal accident rate observed for the glass cockpit cohort in 2006 and 7. Survey data confirmed differences in aircraft activity that likely influenced the type and severity of accidents they were involved in. The overall pattern of study results did not show a significant safety benefit for the glass cockpit study group. This concludes my presentation of the study's statistical analyses, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Member Sumwalt. Thank you. Um, I certainly appreciate the hard work that staff has put into this uh, safety study, and I think that uh, as the official census keeper of aircraft accident data, it is important that we mine that data, and uh, I think through, through that, it can help us in our mission to take, uh, take accidents and, uh, and learn from it so that we can improve uh, aviation safety or all modes of transportation, but specifically in this case, aviation. And I do think uh, after studying this report that the recommendations from this study, if, if these recommendations are implemented, it will improve safety of glass cockpit general aviation aircraft. Uh, for nine years, I flew glass cockpits in an airline environment. I started uh, with a Fokker F-100 and then uh, the Airbus A320. And, uh, and I would contend that the electronic displays on the aircraft in this study, the general aviation study, are in fact more advanced than those that I flew in the airline environment. Uh, for example, in today's general aviation glass cockpits, we have we can get graphical weather information that can be uplinked and displayed. I, I've fought long and hard for that in the airline environment, uh, and, and, and they still don't have it. Um, I think it's wonderful that you can get XM radio or Cirrus uh, weather down uplinked into the aircraft and get the big picture of where, where the convective activity is. Uh, for ground operations, the general aviation aircraft can have moving map displays with own ship position. In flight, they're moving map displays with, uh, with terrain depictions, very graphical terrain depictions. And uh, some of the aircraft even have synthetic vision. But when I look at the technology of the general aviation ac uh, aircraft, and I think about the training that I had in my airline, okay, so the GA aircraft today are more advanced than we had in the airline, but the training that we had for the airline equipment was very thorough, and very comprehensive. I remember on my, on my oral exams for each of those airplanes, uh, we'd probably spend 25% of our total oral exam going over and making sure that I thoroughly understood 
the displays, the symbology, the interpretation of, of uh, what was being presented to me, knowing how to access information. And on the check rides that we had, we would spend uh, significant amounts of time uh, making sure that I knew how to program reroutes and, uh, and change the destination and change the alternates. We had to demonstrate that. Yet for these general aviation aircraft, which are arguably more advanced, the training requirements are not nearly as rigorous. And I believe that something in this, that this study will highlight, and staff is proposing recommendations in that area to improve the training. Now let me ask you a question. I, I want to make sure I understand it. The data set that we looked were, were involved aircraft that were manufactured between 02 and 06, but the but the accident data extended from 02 to 08. Is that correct, Dr. Dr. Roth? Yes, that's correct. One of the reasons for extending it further was to get the benefit of the seven and eight where the population wasn't changing. One of the, one of the difficulties, as I presented on the was presented on the slide, is during that 2006 through 2000 or 2002 through 2006 period the distribution of aircraft within the study population was changing as new aircraft were coming online. So just to be sure that that, that wasn't affecting the accidents, to see what the effect was during uh, 7 and 8 uh, is why we extended it beyond just the manufactured years. Okay, thank you. On page 39 of the draft report, it states, and I quote, of the 266 accidents involving study aircraft between 02 and 08, Accidents involving the glass, accidents involving aircraft in the glass cockpit cohort were significantly more likely to be fatal. And you presented some figures on slide 24. I think the accident rate was 0.43 for, for the fatal accident rate was 0.43 for the conventional and 1.03 for the glass. Just in, in looking at that, that appears to be fairly significant, but what level of statistical significance do you attach to those findings? Well, there's, there's two things there. The, 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 what you're referring to on page 39 was looking at the accidents themselves and comparing within the conventional group when, of those involved in accidents, what percentage were fatal, and in the glass, what percentage were fatal. That was the statistical significance that, that we're talking about. The then when you talk about the rates, that's when we figured in the activity data as well. So that's per 100,000 flight hours. And those, I would say, due to the, although the, the rates reflect a, a difference in accidents per hours flown, the, the one limitation is that because we're only looking at two years, uh, there, there is enough variability in there I'm, that I'm not sure that we can make a statement as to statistical significance. Okay, but back to the first part of that where we do on page 39, we, uh, we, where we take that statement that I just quoted and then we have a, a chi-square value of 8.216 and then a p-value of 0 .0004. Uh, it's been a long time <laughs> since I've taken STAT, but it would appear that that would be highly significant. So, but you're the PhD that did the research, so how, in your words, how significant would that finding be? Um, well, the p-value in that case that you're referring to, 0 .004, represents the, the percent likelihood that this was a, a chance finding. So that's um, less than, it would be four, four tenths of one percent, essentially, is what you're looking at there, four one thousandths. Four one thousand. So, so to recap, the, uh, the statistical significance between the accidents involving glass co the accidents involving aircraft in the glass cockpit cohort compared the statistical significance of, of them being involved in fatal accidents is very significantly statistically significant. I'm not even speaking yeah. English today, but. Uh, but yes, it's essentially you can say it's a strong effect. Okay, we, we believe that that's representative of a, of a true effect. Thank you. Let me, let me go back and characterize some of the study data that you've just presented. 
compared to the conventional cockpits, glass cockpit flights in this study were significantly more likely to have been on an IFR flight plan for the accident flight. They were significantly more likely to have been involved in personal or business flights for the fatal flights. They were on significantly longer flights with a median of 96 miles versus 25 miles for the conventional. They were involved in a higher percentage of accidents during the in-flight phases from initial climb and approach. And they were involved in, a, in, in significantly more accidents involving collision with terrain. So those are the aircraft and the, and the missions that they were on and the type of missions. Now let's talk about the pilots involved in those. Compared to the conventional cockpit pilots, the pilots involved in the glass cockpit cohort, cohort um, were significantly older. And for those pilots uh, with, uh, whose age was known, 12% of the glass cockpit pilots were under 30 compared to 27% of the pilots in the conventional cockpit cohort. Is that correct? That's correct. And although the median age for those two groups was 47 versus 43, that's not that much of a difference. But I think when we look at the distribution of the ages, we found that a significantly greater population, greater percentage of the population of the younger pilots was in the conventional cohort. That's correct. The glass cockpit aircraft pilots were significantly more likely to hold an instrument rating and they had significantly more flying time is basically what I've outlined correct. I think you've summarized it correctly. So what, what do you make of all, all of this? Well, I think it, taking that all as a whole, the, I think the one thing that's quite a bit different is the, uh, the role that instructional flying plays in this is that the, the conventional, the new newly produced conventionally equipped aircraft, more of those were being used for instructional flight. So that would bring in the, the younger pilots, essentially, that are learning to fly. That would also represent why they were doing uh, shorter flights as they were, in, in most cases, were spending more time in the local area practicing maneuvers and things like that. It would also explain the, the takeoffs and landings as they spend more time practicing those events versus the glass that uh, the glass cockpit aircraft that would be more likely to be used on longer trips and expose them to instrument conditions and the types of accidents that might occur in those conditions. So here's really the, the million dollar question. Were the differences between the two cohorts, were they because of the aircraft or were they because of the mission? If you took the pilots Let's say you took the pilots that were flying the, the conventional aircraft and you allowed those conventional aircraft to go out on the, on the same missions that were involved in the, that we saw in the glass cockpit cohorts. Would we have similar results or different results? Well, that's where we, where we get to the point where we can't say for sure, but that's why, why it's important to note the differences in the way they're operated because likely you, you would expect if they were both operated the same way, you would have some that you would have some move toward the center, I guess, would be the way to, to explain that. You would expect more takeoffs and land, landing accidents and things in, in the glass cockpit if they were spent more time practicing uh, those maneuvers, and you would expect more instrument uh, accidents and things like that if they spent more time flying on those longer flights. Thank you. I do have uh, a few more questions, but I will yield and come back to those questions in the second round. Thank you, Member Simmel. Vice Chairman Hart. Thank you, and I add to Member Sumwalt's kudos to the R&E for taking on this study. I think it's a, it's a great idea. I fly a lot of glass cockpit GA airplanes myself, so I'm glad to see someone looking at this intensively. I know the uh, Aircraft Owners and Pilots Association has already done at least two studies on it, and they're referred to in page 20 of your report. I had a question about that because I wanted to see if that how that compared with how their results compared with our results. Uh, and our findings on our uh, conclusions on page 110, we say that this, the draft report says that the study analyses of aircraft accident activity data showed 
a decrease in total accident rates but an increase in fatal accident rates for the selected group of glass cockpit aircraft, and that's consistent with what your slide showed. The reference to the AOPA's Air Safety Foundation reports on page 20 <coughs> notes that while TAAs, which is the glass cockpit, uh, while TAAs made up 2.8 percent of the aircraft fleet, they were involved in 1.5 percent of total accidents and 2.4 percent of fatal accidents. The 1.5 percent being less than the than disproportionately less than the population and is consistent with your conclusion. My question is whether their reference to the 2.4 percent of fatal accidents in TAAs versus 2.8 percent of the population is also consistent with your conclusion. <clears throat> I would say the, the comparison of the two is consistent in that the, the representation in fatal accidents is a little higher than in non-fatal accidents, so that would be consistent. The one thing that is, that is different about the two studies is that's a comparison to general aviation, and we, we had a very specific constrained comparison to a group of aircraft produced during a specific time period. They're, they're matched on those aircraft, but in general, I would say that's consistent because of the they show a higher involvement in fatal accidents, if that makes sense. Oh, yes, and I'm, I was going to ask, ask you also, could it, could it be that I think when I read theirs, their percentages are based on the percentage of the fleet, whereas yours was based on, yours had a denominator in it too as well, if I'm correct. Exactly and correct. and the, when we're talking about percentages, those were the aircraft involved in accidents, so we're, we're only comparing against the accidents. But when we looked at the um, the distribution per fleet, as the, as the uh, slide with the blue bar showed, the distribution per fleet, that was within only those aircraft that we studied. That was not all of general aviation. So, uh, you know, the, there may be other segments of general aviation aircraft that would have higher accident rates, in fact. So as a general matter, would it be safe to say that their conclusions and ours were similar, or were there some differences that should be noted? I, I would say in general they're consistent. Okay. I, I, I would. I would support it. Looking at both studies, I think that there's points where they found similar okay. similar findings. Thank Same you. data. That's all for me, Mr. Chairman. Dr. Groff, are you going to talk about um, training and SDRs in your next presentation? Yes, that's okay. in the qualitative section. Great. Um, kind of a general question that I have for you is historically uh, we have seen when new uh, equipment or aircraft are introduced into the fleet that we tend to see uh, sometimes a spike in the accident rate until it, uh, you know, kind of, I think generally we look at it as the training effect and experience level out. Um, just because this is the in the infancy of the deployment of glass cockpits in the fleet, do you think that there is the possibility that the numbers that we have here may represent that early initial spike and we could see some leveling out, or do you think that this trend will continue if intervention isn't taken? I would think certainly that there's probably some of that here, that we, that it takes a while to to uh, absorb the change within the, the fleet and within training. I think, I guess the, the question would be whether you can minimize some of that by, by taking some steps in anticipation of that. And I think one of the things that's important to note, even though we're talking about the new manufacturer of aircraft entering the fleet, what is the current composition of the total fleet, not just the new aircraft that are being manufactured? Well, to put it in context, I think the, the, the most recent FAA uh, survey data put the, the number of aircraft used in general aviation, it's in excess of 200,000. So we, we only looked at uh, 8,000 aircraft total, and of those within this set, only uh, 5,500 had glass cockpits. So you're, you're talking about a, a, a relatively very small percentage of the entire fleet. The, the average age of GA aircraft is, you know, well over 30 years, almost 40 years old. So one of the, one of the reasons why we see that early spike is because a lot of people might be transitioning to something new. So potentially, because we have a um, a, a vast majority, over what, 95% of the aircraft in the fleet are conventional analog aircraft, that as the new aircraft are being manufactured and integrated into the fleet, we're probably going to have a lot of transition occurring between older uh, aircraft being phased out and the newer aircraft being incorporated. Absolutely. And the one other piece in that that has 
a little more recently um, come in is the opportunity for retrofits as well. So it, it could happen very quickly that some of those aircraft that have been flying around for 25 years could suddenly become glass cockpit equipped aircraft. Great. I have a question for you about that. Does staff have any concerns? Uh, we looked at at the issue of uh, factory manufactured glass cockpits, and uh, I know you're going to address SDRs and some other things later. Um, does staff have concerns about post manufacture retrofit for older aircraft and uh, kind of the validity that is there to make sure that those systems function properly? We didn't address that directly in the study. Uh, they're required to go through a, the STC process and for, for approval for installation in the aircraft, but we didn't address it directly in the study. But, uh, and yeah, maybe. Uh, uh, Chairman, Chairman Herzman, uh, we, uh, uh, Office of Aviation Safety is, has its eye on those types of issues. Anytime an S, uh, supplemental type certificate, a uh, aftermarket modification is available to someone that owns a, uh, uh, an airplane, there's always a concern with whether the original equipment manufacturer, the airplane owner that puts out the flight manual uh, to ensure that there's proper integration between the add-on and what the pilot is being told with guidance through the, uh, the manufacturer's uh, flight manual. Uh, and also the STC process is, is uh, a, a little bit less rigorous and more varied uh, than an airplane going through the uh, rigorous FAA certification process. Uh, uh, there are several different entities can approve an STC, whereas uh, there's a much smaller amount of FAA offices that do the, the aircraft certification. So it's the integration piece that uh, we have our eye on and, and it, 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 we could have concerns with. Very good. Thank you. And we look forward to uh, uh, future work looking at this issue. I think it's going to be a, a growing interest, certainly, for people in the GAA community, and so it's good to stay in front of it. Um, the were um, The report notes that 90% of the new uh, piston-powered light aircraft uh, are equipped with full glass cockpit displays, but that, that leads to, to the conclusion that 10% are not. And so my question to you is why are the 10% um, that are manufactured not equipped with glass cockpits and, um, uh, you know, where's the market for these types of aircraft? Um, I think the statistic you're citing is actually from taken from a gamma um, a gamma, deli a gamma delivery uh, report that it may I think that's actually 2006 so that mm -hmm. it's probably even more than that now there are still some niche markets where someone would uh, perhaps choose to buy an aircraft with conventionally equipped air uh, conventionally equipped instruments or conventional instruments I know that a lot of those that are currently being produced are being produced for uh, export. They may be going to places in the world where they may not have the support necessary to maintain the glass cockpit display, so they may choose to buy those. But I think of the sort of um, typical single-engine piston airplanes that are being bought, almost 100 percent of those are now being purchased with glass cockpit air, uh, avionics. So, so effectively, it's becoming standard equipment. Basically, yeah. yeah. Um, the, uh, in your presentation, you cited a number of different kind of uh, variables where maybe there was more or less training, you know, more experience, mm -hmm. what type of ratings the pilots had. Um, did you look at whether or not the aircraft were owned or, or um, rented? Because I think um, there might be some issues with respect to someone who has a a uh, familiarity, an ownership uh, responsibility, and maybe a choice in the equipment that they procure and, you know, learning it b before they get in the cockpit versus people who might rent um, uh, aircraft. And it may be different um, because there are different displays, uh, different manufacturers that can uh, provide the go glass cockpit displays that you might be in a situation where you're getting something that's unfamiliar to you. Did you all look at how that broke down? Uh, we attempted to look at that, but mm -hmm. in this case we were doing a retrospective look at the accidents and it was it's difficult to piece out the ownership of the aircraft if you're not actually specifically 
collecting that information. Sometimes right. they're owned by clubs where the, the registration of the aircraft may not reflect the, the individual's name. Sure. So it was difficult to reliably piece that out. But I definitely understand the, the concern and that we attempted to look at that but couldn't do it reliably. And the challenge there is because just because of the data sources that you have, the registry information and how it's represented, it's sometimes uh, it's difficult to unravel that. Yes. Yep. Okay. Let's talk about report recording capabilities. Um, our report highlights several areas where um, software and internal memory uh, in the glass cockpit displays um, has been retrieved uh, mm -hmm. by our staff. Sometimes it's a great challenge uh, for us to to work through this, uh, to reverse engineer this information, and sometimes we get very good assistance in trying to uh, pull down some of this information. Can you explain how glass cockpit uh, recording capabilities benefit the Safety Board's accident investigations um, and, you know, accidents where we've investigated that this has been a significant aid to us? And maybe uh, Mr. Cash or Mr. I think Mr. Mr. Gazzetti. Cash is probably hard. Okay. Um, it's obvious of, of great benefit, and uh, we we have a, a reasonably good success rate, uh, even though they're not crash protected uh, or fire protected. We're running probably about 85% recovery rate on, on the data. Um, most of the units do record data. There's uh, one manufacturer, the Garmin units, which unfortunately is the most popular unit out there, uh, chooses not to record data. Uh, they are re kind of changing that position as of late uh, the last year or so. We have had a couple uh, Garmin units that, that are now recording uh, information. I noticed that finding eight of the study um, addresses the potential value of the recording capabilities, uh, but we don't issue a recommendation in this area. So I was wondering if staff could explain what factors they considered um, in this determination not to issue a recommendation about recording capabilities? L let me try to address a couple of general issues here. Um, uh, we'll get into a discussion here in the next presentation about um, uh, the reliability issues associated with these technologies. Um, and we feel that uh, a recommendation that we're making uh, to encourage SDR reporting will be an appropriate first step there to, to address that issue. With regard to accident investigation, um, as I stated, this is an emerging technology and it is our, our first look. Uh, there is no doubt that, that the data that we do retrieve can be very valuable. Um, when we uh, investigate um, basically any accident these days, there are a number of sources of of uh, non-volatile data that's stored in, in electronics on board a variety of vehicles. So we're pretty aggressive about trying to get that information out and see if there's any benefit there. But a couple of factors here that we considered, um, uh, as Jim was alluding to, the, the market is changing very fast right now. This technology is just coming on. Uh, the market is changing fast and it looks as though customer demand is asking for that recorded capability for the customer to then download and, and review uh, his or her data. Uh, so we think that the market is trending in that area. The, the other issue that we were concerned about is these devices are not specifically intended to record accident data. And so we thought, is it, would it be appropriate to essentially put a requirement or ask for a requirement of a device that's not intended to be used uh, in that fashion to, to, to have to, I guess, uh, carry the burden of, of that type of uh, additional uh, requirement. So in the past, our recommendations have focused on essentially commercial aircraft uh, and and as the technologies are changing, we are keeping abreast with that, and we think that in the future there may be more opportunities uh, as costs come down, as technologies improve, that we could see either through the marketplace or through our rec through through uh, recommendations or, or regulatory change. But right now, we do not feel that this class of aircraft it, it would be appropriate to 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 try to make a requirement that these devices uh, have a recording capability on them for accident investigative purposes. 
What about standardization? If it's not required, but standardizing uh, how this information and what's recorded, there could be a voluntary standard. So the standardization of the data that are recorded? Yes, I think, you know, in any, in any um, uh, area where we've looked at this issue, um, and I'll just talk about, let's talk about on the highway side. We've asked for event data recorders, not just in commercial vehicles, but we've asked them, asked for them in passenger cars. And the first step in getting the data recorders into the vehicles was to establish a standard so that everyone understood what the parameters were that were important to record, how frequent the sampling was going to be. Now, clearly, these are things that you all deal with all the time. So my question is, I recognize that we are not in a position where we want to take that step to ask that it be mandatory that there be recording devices, but is there any effort underway to establish some standardization when it comes to light aircraft as far as if they are going to record what do they record and how they record it? Uh, yes, there is. Um, as you know, uh, we talked about this in, in, uh, in some previous uh, uh, accident investigations that we brought before the board. And I'll let Jim Cash um, explain the, um, the international ED-155 standard, which would, would most likely apply here. Um, certainly, data standardization makes our job uh, much easier because we don't have to try to figure out what each individual manufacturer does. But uh, as Joe said, the, the URK specification does have uh, uh, standardization as far as parameters recorded and uh, sample rates. Um, so that work is, is virtually all already been done. It's just a matter of either a manufacturer uh, voluntarily uh, adopting that standard. The uh, Abbott uh, Perio unit is built to the URK-155 standards, so uh, I assume that this, I haven't seen a unit, but I assume that the, uh, the parameter set is going to be as per the specification. Is Aperio the only um, major manufacturer that has adopted the standard, the uh, URK standard? L3 is making a box that uh, would record to the URK-155 standard also. Okay. Thank you very much for uh, sharing that information. I think it's very helpful to understand the platform as we move forward. Member Sumwalt. Thank you. To, uh, to follow on, yes, I was wondering the same thing, why we weren't making a recommendation to, for these data to have downloadable capability. And uh, then it occurred to me that we do have uh, on our most wanted list a recommendation for cockpit image recorders for aircraft of this type, I believe. Uh, to record parametric data. Am I, am I correct there, Mr. Cash? Uh, the, the current recommendation that we have is for uh, kind of commercial turbine aircraft. These are, are typically kind of even the step below that. Okay. I guess really what I was confusing that with would be on the, uh, I guess on the helicopter side, we came out with a recommendation for, for the crash-hardened uh, devices there to, to record uh, image recorders and and uh, but okay. Thank Again, you. we drew the line at Turbin. Okay, thanks. The chairman mentioned retrofits, and I personally also have a concern about that, having been out there and flown flown in the industry. And and uh, you know there there really are a hodgepodge of uh, avionics that are proliferating uh, general aviation aircraft these days, and they're not uh, necessarily integrated. And so uh, that is something that my antennas are are raised on, and I'll be curious to see what we can. Uh, what shakes out of that? Um, I want to I want to refer you to a um, page 54, figure 18. And there were uh, there's a bar chart. It says study accident event type by aircraft. And uh, so so it has. Collision by ter uh, collision with terrain for the glass cockpit cohort, 16% of the uh, of the accidents involved collision with terrain for the glass cockpit, whereas for the conventional cohort it was 8%. And I think that you did say in the report that there was a statistical significance between the 8% and the 16%. I'm curious, uh, these uh, 
glass cockpit aircraft do have uh, moving map displays with terrain depiction, and if anything, you would think that that would, that would assist with terrain avoidance. Why do you think we're still seeing these? Um, one thing there is that aircraft of this vintage, 2002 and on, they probably all had some variation of a multifunction display. They may have had a, a, a GPS with moving map. So they probably, many of them had similar capabilities or some capability in, of uh, moving map display. Um, so it wasn't so much that one had it and the other one didn't. It might be the nature of that and how it was integrated. But the biggest difference, I think, again, gets back to how they were flown. Um, that the, those aircraft, the, the glass cockpit aircraft, having flown more, spend more time on longer trips and in IFR and those kind of conditions, the types of accidents they're going to get into would be a collision in terrain, into terrain would be a very common accident event type in, in uh, IMC, for example. The first statement that you made, did you, did you say that many of the conventionally aircraft, conventionally equipped aircraft also might have had a, a multifunction display that had some other capabilities like terrain depictions? Yes, and when, when I say multifunction display, I'm talking very generally there. It may not look the same as the, the matched MFD PFD combination, but it would it would like it's very common. There's there's some very common um, GPS displays that have moving map capability. Okay. And the reason we use the PFD was because it is very difficult to to identify which ones would have the the map displays. Okay. Thank you. By the same token, if we go down the, to the next bar chart there, bar, bars uh, it shows weather, and it shows. 4% of the accidents involved in the conventional cohort had weather-related uh, issues, whereas 9% of the glass cockpit. Now, I realize that, that you did not draw a statistical significance between those two, but it was very close. But when I see 4% versus 9%, maybe there's not a statistical significant difference, but perhaps from a practical significance, there, there is a difference. And again, same question here. These glass cockpit aircraft have the capability to get XM radio, uh, XM uh, weather uplinked to them. And so why do, why do we uh, feel that there's a difference there? In that case, again, I would have to say um, the safest answer to that would be it's probably due to the fact that they were, they w from the accidents, we saw that they were venturing further and more likely to encounter hazardous weather if you're if you're staying close to home perhaps you, you could it'd be easier to avoid the, the weather conditions or situations where you might in, um, encounter hazardous weather but you're right you would expect perhaps that it would have a a uh, sort of a preventative capability there yeah and I guess the trick is to be able to exploit these capabilities that the aircraft have so that we can in fact prevent the accidents I have no further questions thank you Vice Chairman. Just a quick follow on on that weather question. Does that, can I assume that that weather means all IMC and not just hazardous convective weather? That weather code would be all hazard, any hazardous, any hazardous weather. So it would include IMC or perhaps, you know, a downdraft from a thunderstorm or something like that, that they may not in fact have been in IMC. But I'm saying, does it also include just low vis approaches yes. and stuff? Yes. Okay, so, yeah. so it's more than just the convective hazardous convective stuff, it's all yes, the IMC. Yes, correct, okay. correct. Anything, anything that the investigators thought that the weather encounter Later itself role. was played a role. Yes. Okay, thank you. Dr. Groff, you have one more presentation after this. And yes, then, that's and correct. We'll complete. Uh, let's take a short break, about seven minutes, and we'll reconvene at 1045.
Welcome back. Dr. Groff, if you'd like to proceed with the next presentation. In addition to the statistical analyses, staff reviewed FAA and manufacturer provided training materials, observed factory training, and spoke with representatives of the aviation insurance industry in order to understand the changes in pilot training resources that have been developed for glass cockpit avionics. We also reviewed several accident case studies involving glass cockpit aircraft to identify safety issues. Four safety issue areas were identified, including a need to update pilot training and testing requirements to address glass cockpit avionics, a need to provide pilots with more detailed information about system failure modes, and a need for pilots of glass cockpit aircraft to receive equipment-specific training. In addition to pilot training issues, staff identified a need to improve equipment malfunction and service difficulty reporting. A review of training materials showed that airframe manufacturers provide training for their aircraft, including the avionics systems. Typical factory training programs include several days of ground and flight instruction. Factory training is available to anyone, but is typically provided as part of the purchase price of a new aircraft. This suggests that manufacturer training mostly benefits the first owner of a new aircraft or those pilots who sp specifically seek out such training. In addition, aviation insurance providers have a strong influence on pilot training because they can require pilots to complete training as a condition of their insurance coverage. These requirements are tailored to individual pilots and vary by company, but usually exceed FAA's regulatory requirements. FAA worked with academic and industry groups to develop the FAA Industry Training Standards, or FITS, initiative in response to pilot training needs associated with new advanced aircraft technologies. The original FITS program plan advocated aircraft type-specific training and the use of scenario-based techniques to teach pilots the decision-making skills needed to safely operate aircraft with advanced automation. Although the FAA has incorporated FITS principles into its training material, its updates to training manuals and handbooks have included only generic discussions of glass cockpit avionics. The FAA has not implemented the type-specific training requirements suggested in the original FITS program documents and does not require any specific training or certification for general aviation pilots with regard to glass cockpit avionics. Further, FAA Airman Knowledge Tests, such as those required for the Private Pilot Certificates and Instrument Ratings, do not currently assess pilots' knowledge of glass cockpit displays. Staff believes that all pilots should be able to dem demonstrate a minimum knowledge of primary aircraft flight instruments and displays to be prepared to safely operate aircraft equipped with those systems and has proposed recommendations in this area. The importance of pilots understanding the unique operating characteristics of cockpit instruments can be illustrated by an accident that occurred on April 9, 2007, near Luna, New Mexico, involving a glass cockpit-equipped aircraft. The pilot reported that he was in instrument conditions and was climbing to avoid building thunderstorms and snow showers when the airspeed indication started to decrease. Then the airspeed and altitude information on the PFD changed to failure indications. While attempting to respond, the pilot became disoriented and activated the aircraft's ballistic recovery parachute. The pilot was uninjured, but the aircraft sustained, sustained substantial damage. In this case, the multiple failure indications on the PFD led the pilot to initially misinterpret likely pitot tube intake blockage due to icing as a PFD system failure. Had an event similar to the one in Luna, New Mexico involved a conventionally equipped aircraft, its cockpit might have looked something like the one pictured here. A conventional airspeed indicator, indicated here by the yellow box, is fed by inputs from the pitot system, which senses the dynamic air pressure produced by the forward motion of the aircraft, and the static system, which senses the ambient pressure surrounding the aircraft. If the pitot tube drain remains open, a blockage of the pitot tube intake will typically result in a decreased or zero airspeed indication, while the remaining instruments should continue to function normally. Electronic displays are considerably different. They use pressure sensors, solid state gyros, and accelerometers to replicate the functions of conventional instruments. 
A typical PFD relies on an Attitude and Heading Reference System, or AHARS, to determine aircraft orientation and heading, and an air data computer to calculate parameters such as airspeed, altitude, and vertical speed, identified here by the yellow boxes. Data recovered from the onboard memory in the PFD installed in the Luna Accident aircraft showed that when the airspeed indication decreased to zero, the PFD software flagged the data the pitot data input as invalid. The system logic subsequently flagged all air data parameters as invalid, which resulted in the air data on the display being replaced with red X indications. The PFD operated as designed in this case, but differently than conventional cockpit instruments. The accident aircraft was also equipped with conventional backup instruments displaying airspeed, attitude, and altitude that pilots are instructed to use in the event of a PFD malfunction. But this is a challenging task when a pilot is faced with an unexpected indication on the compelling primary display. To ensure that pilots are informed of how their aircraft operates, the FAA requires all aircraft to be furnished with an, an aircraft flight manual that must contain information about the safe operation of aircraft systems in the event of malfunction. The aircraft flight manual supplement for the PFD installed in the accident aircraft included a full description of an air data computer failure, but did not include specific information about system behavior in response to the loss of data inputs, like that from the PO2 blockage, suggesting that pilots are not always provided all of the information necessary to adequately understand system operation and possible failures. Staff has proposed a recommendation in this area. The basic six conventional flight instruments are similar from one aircraft to another and from one manufacturer to another. In contrast, the computerized systems at the heart of electronic PFDs combine electronic compon components and software that are both unique to a particular manufacturer and subject to change with future system software revisions. As a simple example, this is an illustration of a conventional attitude indicator. In this case, it's copied from the FAA's Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge. The design and operation of conventional instruments are so standardized that training materials have often included these sorts of cutaway schematics to explain how the instruments operate. On the other hand, this is an illustration of an AHAR system from the same FAA handbook. And as you can see, they don't lend themselves to the same sort of understanding. Instead, pilots must under, learn to understand the behavior of the software driving the systems in the aircraft they fly. Prior experience with conventional instruments or generalized training does not adequately prepare pilots to safely operate aircraft equipped with glass cockpit avionics due to the complexity and variety of system designs. The lack of FAA training requirements and the variability of non-regulatory training options suggest that additional equipment-specific training requirements are necessary to ensure that all pilots of glass cockpit-equipped aircraft possess the knowledge and skill necessary to operate their aircraft safely. Staff has proposed a recommendation in this area. Glass cockpit displays also pose challenges for flight instructors they do not face with conventional instruments. Failures of conventional instruments can be simulated by covering the instrument face, but a PFD integrates the information from multiple systems into a single display, making it difficult to simulate some failures without using inappropriate techniques like pulling circuit breakers. The most common method of simulating PFD failure is to reduce the display screen brightness until it appears blank. Although it's easy to simulate, total screen failure may not be the most likely failure a pilot will encounter. Simulators and procedural trainers provide a practical alternative for pi training pilots to identify and respond to PFD failures and malfunctions. Not all general aviation pilots have ready access to approved flight simulator training devices. However, many avionics manufacturers provide training materials to support their products, including PC-based procedural trainers. This is an example, is a screenshot of a PC-based procedural trainer that replicates the, the system in one of the aircraft uh, in this study. And it's 
you can see that it replicates the, the actual operation on the upper left is a PFD, on the upper right is the MFD. And as, this is demonstrating pull-down menus where you can actually simulate failures of the major systems within the, the uh, displays, in this case is an AHARS failure. Pilots who do not have ready access to approved flight simulators or training devices could benefit from equipment-specific training using software applications or procedural trainers that replicate glass cockpit displays. Staff has proposed a recommendation in this area. Another issue identified during the review of accident reports was a general lack of available information about equipment malfunctions and service difficulties. One example is an accident involving a glass cockpit equipped aircraft that occurred on January 15, 2005 in Coconut Creek, Florida. The accident pilot lost control of the aircraft in instrument meteorological conditions shortly after departure. The airplane impacted a house and terrain and the pilot was fatally injured. Prior to the accident, the pilot transmitted a report of unspecified avionics problems. NTSB investigators were unable to verify the reported failure due to the severity of impact damage, but a review of the accident aircraft maintenance found that the PFD had been replaced multiple times before the accident in response to an air data failure, a course indicator failure, damage caused during installation of other equipment, and an AHARS data failure. Manufacturers are required to report certain failures in their equipment to the FAA. However, equipment reliability information is generally not made public. The FAA's Service Difficulty Reporting System is a large repository of publicly available aircraft service information that can be used to track equipment failures. SDR reporting is required for aircraft operating under Part 121, 135, and 125, but reporting is not required for general aviation. A review of FAA's SDR system found no records associated with any of the prior PFD malfunctions or installation damage involving the Coconut Creek, Florida accident aircraft. The FAA recently initiated a review of the regulations and processes associated with light aircraft certification. And as a first step in that review, the FAA published the results of a Part 23 Small Airplane Certification Process Study by FAA and industry group representatives in July 2009. The report identified underuse of the SDR system by general aviation maintenance personnel as a continuing problem. The FAA's current review of Part 23 certification provides an opportunity to take steps to report to improve equipment malfunction and defect reporting for light aircraft. Staff believes that tracking equipment reliability and service difficulties is particularly important for this new technology and has proposed a recommendation in this area. In summary, the results of this study suggest that for the aircraft and time period studied, the introduction of glass cockpit PFDs has not yet resulted in the anticipated improvement in safety when compared to similar aircraft with conventional instruments. Advanced avionics and electronic displays can increase the safety potential of general aviation aircraft operations by providing pilots with more operational and safety-related information and functionality, but more effort is needed to ensure that pilots are prepared to realize that potential. Providing pilots with more information about equipment design and operation, adoption of additional training elements, and improved reporting of equipment malfunctions and service difficulties are likely to improve the safety of all general aviation operations. However, such actions are particularly important in order to achieve the potential safety benefits of new cockpit display technologies. That concludes my presentation. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Groff. Member Sumwalt? Yes, thank you. Um, I looked at, the, uh, at an old report created by the FAA back in 1996. It's the, uh, the FAA Human Factors Team report on the interfaces between flight crews and the modern flight deck systems, dated June the 18th of 1996, and it was done in response to several air carrier accidents uh, that were automated aircraft. And as I went through the findings of that report, it talks about pilot understandings of the automation's capabilities 
and uh, a number of training-related issues. Processes uses, used for design and training, insufficient knowledge and skills, and things of that nature. And indeed, we found the same sorts of things in this study, did we not, Dr. Groff? I, yeah, I'd say in, in general, I think that the issues that that uh, general aviation is going to have to go through is very similar to what the air carrier went through. In fact, uh, five of four of the five findings in this current study of ours relate to training, training and improving methods of training, and five of the six recommendations address training. So there are some similarities, and that is really I don't think we have to go go back and reinvent the wheel. There's some good work out there. Uh, there's a, an automation, an industry automation working group that's been going on in the air carrier community now for about four years, and they should be reporting out their results uh, by the end of this year. Um, so the point is, is that uh, that the work that the air carrier community is doing should not be in a vacuum from the general aviation community, and I suspect that there can be some uh, some result, some uh, findings and results can permeate uh, to the general aviation community as well. Um, the factory training, when I buy a new Cirrus or something like that and I go to the factory training, that, that training applies to me, but how about if I sell the aircraft to, to the chairman? Does she get the benefit of the uh, factory training? She certainly could. Uh, at this point, it doesn't it doesn't go along with the aircraft, um, but anyone can pay the money and go and get the training, but it, it's not included in the purchase price, obviously, on, on future sales of the aircraft. Generally speaking, for someone else other than the original buyer to, to obtain this training at the factory, uh, how much money are we talking about? Boy, I'd, have, I, I'd hesitate to say the, the exact amount. I'm, I'm not actually sure what the, the total amount is. It'd be it's several thousand dollars to, to get a, an entire training package. Okay. Is there currently an FAA requirement to sign off uh, a logbook endorsement for, for glass cockpit airplane like their aircraft like they are for high performance uh, endorsement or something like that? No, there's no specific requirement. There, uh, there, go, go ahead. ahead. There, there was some discussion, in, uh, as I mentioned, in the early FITS work that perhaps that that, uh, that, that could be included as an, um, under 6131H, but that, uh, that has not actually been implemented. Is it the opinion of staff that there should be the requirement for a, uh, for a logbook sign-off, logbook endorsement? I think that what we would... My opinion would be that the nature of that requirement, uh, we would not be so prescriptive as to say exactly how that should happen, but I think there's definitely a concern that there needs to be some sort of uh, specific training there. One of the issues with, you bring up uh, high performance sign off, that's a once and done uh, approach. I think one of the concerns would be that we would rather have some, some sort of explicit um, requirement to, to cover certain areas that may be incorporated in recurrent training or something like that, that to make sure that people continue to stay current because, as we noted, the, these systems can change after they go out. Unlike a conventional cockpit, you can update the software, and that could change, potentially change the functionality of the equipment. Do we have uh, proposed recommendations in the area that you just mentioned there that uh, there should be a requirement for a structured training program for, for pilots to undergo um, for each aircraft or aircraft system that they're operating? I think that gets to the, the uh, recommendation for equipment-specific training for, for uh, pilots of aircraft equipped with this equipment. Okay. And that would be uh, by a recommendation... Okay. Thank you. As I mentioned, we have five of the six recommendations that staff is proposing do relate to training and improving the quality thereof. Um, let me ask you a question, Dr. Groff, while I've got you, um, before I flip uh, to Mr. Gazzetti. 
page 81 of the report, we talked about standardization of instrument design and operations. And I guess this is really not a, it's not a question, but it's a, it's a statement. We not only see issues of design uh, standardization in general aviation aircraft, but we saw this in a recent uh, air carrier accident as well. In the Colgan air accident, we noted that the, uh, that the aircraft's uh, uh, primary flight display on the airspeed indicator, it lacked uh, this uh, amber band above the low speed cube. Uh, a cue that is uh, found on most other transports that we could find. So the standardization issue is not just an issue in general aviation. It's, uh, it's uh, also in air carriers as well, and it's something that is of concern to this board. We came out with a finding on that, on the Colgan air accident, as well as uh, recommendations in that area. I, I want to go to Mr. Gazzetti. Um, we did hear the chairman asked a question a little while ago about, about accident investigation. We heard from Mr. Cash. Uh, that we can get, uh, you know, about 80 percent of these these um, primary flight, these uh, EFAS instruments, we're able to re recover uh, information from. But Mr. Gazzetti, actually, from a, since you, since your division is out doing the accident investigations of the regional uh, across the country of general aviation accidents, what effects, both positive and negative, uh, are having the glass cockpits having on uh, on accident investigation? Remember, Sumwalt, the positive effects, uh, I think, outweigh the negative effects, but I'll talk to both. The, the, the positive effects are, are, as Mr. Cash alluded to, on 80 percent of these. Mr. Kudikasetti, could you pull the mic a little closer? Certainly. I'm sorry. Uh, on the 80 percent that Mr. Cash uh, mentioned of these aircraft that are equipped with these systems with non-volatile memory, we are getting, uh, uh, we're being able to more quickly and more accurately solve these accidents. Uh, they are basically a poor man's flight data recorder, uh, and they're, uh, they're, they're, they've really helped us uh, in our investigative capability in, in determining uh, uh, accident causation. Um, almost to the, it's almost a challenge trying to drink from a fire hose the data that's coming out of this non-volatile memory. It's, it's exponentially more than the, the flight data recorders in, in some fashion for some of these things. We're just getting data on everything, and it takes a lot of time to validate the data, verify it, determine what it means. But in the end, we're going to do that, and we're going to be able to solve the accident. In the 20 percent of the cases uh, that the chips are just too damaged or whatever the case, uh, we may have been able to get better data or uh, uh, existing evidence from, from the steam gauges, whether it be a needle slap mark or a gyro housing scoring or something like that. But uh, I think that's a small price to pay given the, uh, the, the vast amount of data we're getting from the non-volatile memory. And quite frankly, if your circuit shifts for the non-volatile memory are so damaged in the impact, well, then more than likely your steam gauge readings at the accident site are going to be just as unreliable or, or destroyed. So uh, the positive benefit is huge. The negative benefit is the challenge now of dealing with all this data and the time it takes to extract data from the damaged chips and uh, a little bit of a challenge of not doing the normal forensic uh, uh, round dial, needle slap marks, and, and physical metal against metal. But again, I don't think that's a, a significant issue. Thanks. Does the uh, does the investigative staff have the the experience to deal with these? I guess for the most part, they're sending the uh, the the flight displays to our um, to research and engineering, where it goes to the lab, and then those guys are the ones actually doing the data analysis. Whereas in the in in with a needle slap mark, I suspect that the field investigators themselves were doing the analysis of. Uh, of, of those types of things. I guess really what I'm wondering is with the change of technology, is the safety board geared up properly, staffed properly, uh, trained properly to deal with this change of technology? Well, I'll let Mr. Cash address that. Uh, he is, uh, you know, basically we provide him with customers, uh, whether it be a handheld GPS unit or a, or a smashed uh, uh, thing uh, that we see. Uh, he's been getting a lot of them, and he's been doing his best to process them, uh, and I know the board has sought additional monies for laboratory facilities, but I'll let Mr. Cash address that issue. Uh, as Jeff said, we are trying to keep up, and uh, it is a, a continuing challenge to, to keep up, um, 
we did get receive additional funding for the laboratory improvements and with that we are making uh, uh, software tools and uh, development of, of new techniques to uh, to try to you know stay abreast of the of current technology thank you and uh, so who when we get this these data who owns that data uh, does the pilot own it does the manufacturer own it does the NTSB own it Insurance companies. That's a that's a very good question, and that's a an emerging challenge. Uh, some manufacturers uh, believe well have proprietary uh, ownership of the data that we need, uh, or the software that we need, that, that Mr. Cash needs to download it. Um, uh, it's kind of a we we've been getting good results from the owners or the manufacturers, but push comes to shove. Uh, that's probably more of a legal question um, that, that we'll have to address uh, as we get more and more into this. So stay tuned. <laughs> That's, uh, I'm willing to let it go at that <laughs> unless someone else wants to weigh in on that. I don't see, okay. General Counsel. Uh, Member Sumwalt, uh, you've pointed out an issue and that is uh, there are not common software programs that we use for the flight data recorders on commercial airlines available uh, to the NTSB. We have to seek these on a case-by-case -case basis. We have encountered some resistance from some manufacturers, and we have discussed this with our um, oversight committees uh, in the House and Senate. Uh, and uh, um, during this reauthorization, we had hoped to get some clarification uh, on that issue. Um, I will tell you it's been a frank exchange with those oversight committees, and I believe we do have a uh, course ahead of us uh, in which we will assert our right as an investigative agency, as an independent investigative agency, to get access to that software uh, when we need it in the course of an accident or incident investigation. Thank you very much. And Mr. Gizzetti, did you have something to add to yeah, that? Yeah, I just wanted to add that uh, uh, the bottom line is is we, we take custody of the wreckage. And if that wreckage has the electronic data, well, then, as far as we're concerned, we, we have custody of that data. Okay, thank you. And, and, and just to wrap it up, as I was going through this study, I want to see if this sort of, sort of sums it up, Dr. Dr. Groff. Would it be fair to state that the advances in technology – can provide benefits to general aviation, but, but we have to do a better job of preparing pilots to operate these aircraft. Is that a fair statement? I think that sums it up very well. Thank you very much. Vice Chairman. Dr. Groff, I um, was struck in when I read the, uh, the study that there's, there's been a lot of people who have looked at issues uh, um, like this, and Member Sumwalt talked about in the, uh, on the commercial side. Uh, but we've also uh, cited a number of military studies, in particular uh, some done by the Army with the introduction of uh, glass cockpit technology into helicopter fleets, some of the challenges that they had. And to me it sounded um, uh, very much uh, like, like the findings that we had uh, found. They analyzed accident rates uh, for helicopters with conventional and glass cockpits, and their study results indicated a significantly higher rate for the glass cockpit configuration group than the conventional cockpit. And the author suggested that the findings provided reason for concern and discussed several possible reasons for the difference, including the possibility that concurrent mission and equipment changes um, rather than cockpit design alone contributed to higher accident rates. And then they, they talked to the pilots, and the pilots said they actually prefer the glass cockpit um, but and they believe that it, it improves safety, but they found learning to use the displays and maintaining their proficiency to be more difficult, and they reported issues of higher cognitive workload in the glass cockpit aircraft than the conventional aircraft. Um, similarly, uh, AOPA did a number of uh, studies on TAAs, and I think that um, they identified a very important issue that I think we're seeing here too that the TAAs provide increased available safety, a potential for increased safety. However, to actually obtain the available safety, pilots must receive additional training in the specific TAA systems 
in their aircraft that will enable them to exploit the opportunities and operate within the limitations inherent to the systems. And I think that um, what you have done is you've been able to take data, uh, a good a subset of data, a snapshot in time, and validate the findings that we've made that are very similar to some of the findings that others have made. And so I think that lends more credibility and strength to this issue of addressing training. And it's, it's going to be and it continue to be very important. Um, Toffler said, uh, the great growling engine of change is technology. And I think that um, you can't take the human out of the human machine interface. And we can have great uh, improvements to technology. But ultimately, the human being that's in the cockpit that's giving purpose and intent to what that aircraft is doing has got to be engaged in, with what the system can do. Um, I think that uh, it was very interesting to me to look back. Um, you all identified a very early investigation before the safety board even exists, and it's one that's very famous, the 1959 Mason City, Iowa accident where uh, Richie Valens, Big Bopper, and Buddy Holly were killed. And um, you pointed out that even then, this issue of familiarization with the equipment and training was important because the pilot in that case wasn't qualified to operate that aircraft and uh, it was a different attitude uh, indicator than he'd had before. And so I think that, that these threads are very, are very common threads. We've seen it in highly technical uh, commercial aircraft. Um, one that I recall in particular was the Midway overrun where we had two very experienced, proficient pilots, but they did not have an understanding of what was behind the assumptions that the machine was making. And so because they were not you know, informed uh, and familiar with the assumptions that the machine was making in order to do their landing distance assessment, they made some assumptions that were incorrect and basically eliminated their safety margin. And so um, I think that we can see that glass cockpit displays are complex. Uh, they are going to require additional training. I have to say that um, just last, last week when I went out, it was very high workload. I mean, you kind of think that, oh, technology is going to make things simpler. And I recognize that we were in a kind of a busy flight. You know, we did some different approaches and we were doing some things. But I'll tell you, even though there was an autopilot that was being used, there was constant programming and changing of things that needed to go on and, um, you know, just pushing the wrong button at the wrong time, you end up having to start over and kind of re, you know, re-begin the process. Um, and I think familiarity and experience would definitely pay off. But, um, but I think even then there's an over potential for over-reliance. And I think the member Sumwalt talked about the um, CFIT accidents. And I think that not just our investigations, but looking at some of the other uh, reports that other uh, folks had done, including the AOPA report, um, one of the areas where they talk about is potentially an over-reliance on the technology about getting into weather uh, conditions that because you think you have this weather tool there that can help you get around it, you take maybe take more risks than you would have uh, in in a conventional uh, aircraft. So um, I think kind of guarding against those types of things is going to be a big challenge uh, for us. But I apologize. I do have some questions in here. <laughs> I know it was a lengthy monologue to get there. But um, uh, one of the things that was interesting to me was the training issue. And Member Sumwalt asked about this. But if many aircraft are out in, the, in this fleet for decades, they're likely going to change owners. And so um, this issue, and I recognize you didn't know how much the standalone training that might be required by insurance um, would be, but it seemed like we had real gradations between the type of training that people could get. And I wonder if not only kind of from a cost perspective, but for the cost value perspective, um, if you have some comments, there's factory type training, uh, maybe simulator training, uh, PC based training, and all of these things could fill a gap for, uh, for an aviator. Um, but the gradation is going to be very different about what you're going to get, uh, the quality that you're going to get, and maybe the oversight that you would get, or um, maybe someone making sure that you're proficient if you're doing it at home on your own PC, 
and you're making mistakes, you know, the question is, is are you going to recognize that? So do you have any comments about the different types of training that would be available as far as cost and value? I think you're right that there's a, a wide variety of training out there. Uh, you know, you can you can train in a, in a flight school or you could train at a local airport uh, with a flight instructor. There's a wide variety of training. I know we mentioned briefly um, in the presentation the FAA's FITS initiative. And one of the things that they have done is they have a, a um, I don't want to mix, mischaracterize it, but it's almost a, a, an approval process or an acceptance process where they can review a training program and say, this meets sort of our standard for um, the sort of the way the, the training is presented and sort of the issue areas that we would like to see covered. It's not a it's not by any means a requirement, but it's almost a good housekeeping seal. You can put the fit seal on your program. So there, there are um, options out there to identify maybe this has gone through some sort of a, a, a review beyond uh, a, another option that may not have been uh, reviewed. There are a, a large number of um, third-party uh, vendors of training programs as well that you can get training materials, but there, there is a big range, and it is sort of up to the, the pilot to decide. And is there anyone who looks at the quality of that training to make sure that it's um, adequate? Well, I guess the, the FAA, the FITS program has, is an attempt at that, but ultimately there is a, a, a uh, in general aviation, there's a strong reliance on the flight instructors, certificated flight instructors, to pro to review the training and, and to be doing the training that's required and to evaluate pilots to ensure that they have the skills and capabilities that, that they think are necessary to safely fly these aircraft. But for those flight instructors, um, are there any requirements on the FAA's practical test standards or anything else that they might be using to measure uh, whether or not their pilots are qualified or successful uh, that addresses their proficiency with the glass cockpit? Specifically glass cockpit, no, other than general requirements to understand and operate the systems in their aircraft. Um, practical test standards typically address things like um, you know, out within certain altitude limits or maintaining heading within a certain degrees or airspeed, those mm -hmm. are sort, of, sort of the precision parameters that need to be able to, to be met. Um, but in general, the, with the glass cockpit, no. It's well, and then that raises some questions to me because um, there are specific procedures the pilots are expected to hear, adhere to um, as far as operation of the aircraft. But I, uh, I get the sense that the buttonology on, I'm not sure if there's a better word for it, but for these systems, um, there might be procedures that are trained at the factory, but there also might be um, uh, um, techniques that people use that are not necessarily consistent with um, the factory trained procedures. And so how can we even ensure that the instructors, you know, kind of are consistent in what they're training the, uh, the new pilots for? And, you know, you might have shortcut ways, you might figure out shortcut ways to do things but there might be a reason that you don't do it that way. But if you're not, you know, if you're not fully qualified on the system, you don't aren't going to know that. Yeah, uh, maybe as an example, the the use of uh, circuit breakers. You can, in some of these systems, you can fail, for example, the AHAR system uh, specifically by pulling a circuit breaker. Well, we've a lot of experience, both the NTSB and the FAA uh, recognize that that's, it's inappropriate to do that and there's been problems caused by using a circuit breaker as a switch and that's not something you want to do. So that, as a small example, that might be one. Right. And uh, I'll focus just a little bit on the, uh, on the defects area. Um, the FAA requires reporting of certain equipment failures you mentioned in your presentation but that that failure information isn't made public and therefore the SDR system is a one way to kind of address uh, failures. Why isn't the information that's provided to the FAA about uh, required uh, reporting of equipment failures made public? 
I guess I couldn't speak for them, but I would imagine that it, it probably touches on a, a proprietary information when they, when they would have to fully understand the way a system behaved. Let's say they, they would get into communication with the FAA about exactly what happened. They would probably get very deep into the design of a system and how it operated, and that may cross over into proprietary information that they might have business reasons why they would not want to make that public, if that makes sense. The actual numbers, I can't, I can't say why that would not be public. But the SDR uh, reports are made public. Yeah, and the SDR reports would be from the sort of the user's side of things, from the, the maintenance technicians or the, the operators of the aircraft say, I experienced this problem rather than uh, the sort of detailed communication that might go on between the FAA and the manufacturer when they identify the specific safety issue. The SDR system could, in fact, be a trigger for that, that required FAA manufacturer communication. If they suddenly start seeing some of these uh, show up in the SDR system, that, that's one of the things that might trigger a more detailed look from the FAA. But one of the challenges that we know, and I think you cited here, uh, in particular with Part 23 aircraft, is that there's an underreporting. But that's not uncommon. We've seen that across the board with SDRs. And so um, does it give the staff pause that we're going to continue to rely in our recommendation? We make a recommendation about SDRs. Um, rely on a system that has in the past proved unreliable to some extent because of the underreporting, and so without any mandatory requirements about the performance of um, the glass cockpit equipment, we're still going to be in a situation where we're having to wait and see and relying on data that may not be complete? Well, I think as the FAA themselves and the industry representatives pointed out in their certification process study, that the, the system needs help and that perhaps the way forward may be an alternative system. I, I, I can't speak for them, but that, that is one option. And so we, we have included a, a finding to say that you've recognized it, we also recognize it, and now that you're reviewing certification requirements for these aircraft, perhaps now is the time to address this. But the, our recommendation for the SDR reporting is in sort of an interim with the hope that uh, perhaps there's an alternative way of uh, collecting this information. I understand. And Mr. Gazzetti, I think, uh, unfortunately, this is what we call tombstone mentality, but we're going to have to rely on our accident investigations to perhaps reveal some failures to understand whether or not the SDR reporting system uh, is robust enough to capture some of these incidents before they become accidents. And so uh, I hope that you'll continue to look, to look at this issue and if there's areas where we need to make recommendations. If uh, this is the interim step, let's think about what's next, too. We, we will do that. And it's, uh, it's not just uh, SDRs. It's also the, the Part 25 uh, requirement on manufacturers to report defects. Uh, and uh, uh, we absolutely have our eye on the ball in that regard as we continue to investigate more and more of these glass cockpit accidents, some of them cited in this study, in which erroneous indications occur while you're in instrument conditions. And, uh, uh, you know, they're not operating with your standard six-pack of instruments anymore where you, where you train to, to recognize certain failures and compensate for them. Now it becomes much more complex. So the... Uh, uh, the data needed to get into the reliability of these systems and to uh, ferret out problems so that you let uh, the FAA and the pilots know what problems are out there and how to handle them is, is very important. And we are uh, actively involved in, in hard targeting specific investigations in that regard. Thank you very much. Member Sumwalt? Uh, no further questions, Madam Chairman. Vice Chairman Hart? It's been a long time since I dealt with the SDR system, but my understanding is that the information comes, that comes into the SDR program is public. Is that, do I have that correct? That's correct. Okay, so that's apparently the reason why it's not well, as well used as a lot of people would like is because people are concerned that when they submit things to the SDR, because there's a judgment call on whether that should be submitted or not. So if, if, if you know, provider A says, okay, we'll provide everything we've got, 
then the media gets a hold of that and says uh, this is a trouble spot, whereas provider B is really, you know, stingy about providing information to the SDR. So now that same media source says, oh, provider B must be in good shape. So that's my recollection of it is that's why the SDR system has the problems it does because it's the fuzziness of deciding whether something needs to be submitted or not discourages people from providing it because then they look bad in the in the media. That that would be the, sort of the underlying problem. I guess we would want to. I mean, I know this is not this issue is not SDR as such, but I, that would be one of the issues we'd want to look at. W one of the uh, remedies, though, for the I'm, I'm a little bit nervous about having the, the regulatory machinery in on requiring certain training as opposed to the insurance community. It would seem to me the insurance community, as you mentioned, their 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 remedies are much more surgically focused to that specific pilot and that specific equipment. It seems to me that we, we'd want to engage the insurance community if we want to look for a real solution to make sure that people are trained in the equipment they're flying because there's the equipment is there's so much of it and it and it, and it changes so rapidly that I'm, I'm thinking that a more appropriate focus might be to engage the insurance community rather than try to see if the regulatory machinery is the appropriate way to do it. Yeah, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, I guess from the, the discussions I had, they recognize that it, it's a business decision whether to extend coverage and what they require uh, when extending that coverage may be as much as their history with an individual. It, there, there can be a lot of things that go into that and they may, they may make certain business decisions about whether to extend coverage because they're competing with other insurance providers. Um, so perhaps the decisions that go into the requirements they have may be a little bit different than, than FAA or, a, you know, a regulatory requirement. There is also the phenomenon out there of uh, self-insuring, that, that it is possible to, to fly an aircraft without insurance if you, if you would so choose, and then you would have no requirement. I think it might be interesting as we look to future steps in this to try to see if we can get the insurance community engaged with us in determining the most effective way to make sure that people are properly trained in the equipment that they're flying. As a renter pilot myself, I know that I have to get checked out in every specific airplane, and that means I'm, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to satisfy somebody that I can fly if it's got glass cockpit that I can fly with that glass cockpit in it. So I, I'm thinking that that's, that's a, a much more flexible and surgical way to address the issue than the broad, cumbersome regulatory approach that the FAA has. So I, I would suggest that as we look into this in the future, we engage the insurance community to work with us and seeing if we can come up with a remedy that works. I, one thing to add to that, I do know that several of the manufacturers actually, I mean, the manufacturers do work very closely with the major insurance providers as well to, to you know, sort of either adjust their, their sort of recommended requirements. Right. Okay. Thank you. That's all for me. Um, in the, report, in the study, we discuss a, a somewhat streamlined process for light aircraft as far as certification uh, uh, goes. I wonder if the um, staff could comment. Are the standards for um, failure modes for the equipment in GA aircraft less rigorous than uh, required for commercial aircraft? Uh, you know, we, we always talk about 10 to the minus ninth and, you know, different challenges. Are they the exact same standards or are they less rigorous? Uh, no, they're actually, um, you know, regardless of what the, the equipment's capable of, the, the hazardous risk assessment process is a little bit different. There's actually a um, four categories from a, s a light single engine reciprocating aircraft under 6,000 pounds up to a, what would be a commuter aircraft, something akin to like a Beach 1900. Um, and the reliability requirements are a little bit are less. It's, it's still based on the risk um, associated with that particular event. Say a, uh, a wing spar failure would be considered catastrophic. That's going to have the highest. But something like um, information displays like this would be considered uh, perhaps even minor because they have backup. And that would put them perhaps in the 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 4, it's much, much, much less than, than the 10 to the minus 9th that typically gets thrown around for Part 25. Okay. So um, I think the interesting thing here is, is that the system, uh, we're, we're, let's just talk about the avionics, you know, the glass cockpit avionics. Um, there is, there are 
in uh, our certification studies and other things that we put out, we talk about kind of redundancies and failure modes. Um, so my understanding would be in this case, because they still have the round dials uh, to serve as a backup, that the integrity of the um, avionics is not going to be seen as critical. Is that correct? Because they'd be able to say if that blanked, you'd still have this equipment. Um, I, hopefully I'm not mischaracterizing it, but it's the, the display of information. So if the, the conventional round dials can continue to accurately display that information, it makes the primary, the loss of the primary flight display, uh, you can, you can accept that because you still have the information available. Hopefully I'm not oversimplifying or mischaracterizing that, but I would think that would, that's how to explain that. Okay. Um, but are they testing kind of the failure modes uh, to ensure that um, if you lose the electronics that you still have the um, the round dials, that, that the failure modes are going to be different and unlikely to occur at the same time? In most cases, the uh, while the primary flight displays are electronic or electrically driven, the displays themselves are electric, electrically driven, the, um, the airspeed indicator is just is measuring pressure differentials that has no electrical input. The altimeter is also measuring the static pressure around the aircraft, and they, they require no power source. The um, attitude indicator is often a vacuum-driven system that runs off a mechanical vacuum pump on the engine. So they, they would be, in most cases, they're independent. The only thing they do share is, like, for example, in the uh, Luna accident we mentioned, the, the pitot system that's feeding the dynamic pressure, airspeed information, that's feeding that to the primary flight display is also feeding that to the altimeter. So you would, you would lose the, that information on the primary flight display and you would also lose the airspeed indication on your backup. Okay. But it sounds like one of the things that we're seeing is when they lose their primary uh, flight displays and they, they lose um, the avionics that's associated with um, the cockpit that they're used to and that they're kind of maybe familiar with, that they're not doing well in some situations as we're finding in accident investigations where people are reporting that they're having problems and then they crash. They're not doing well transitioning to uh, conventional um, operation. And so even though the instrumentation may continue to function, it seems to me that there's still some questions about how the human <coughs> beings are functioning. And particularly, it seems to me, as the demographics change and you're going to have fewer, uh, a, a lower percentage of the pilots in the, uh, in the cohort that, that have a long experience or history with conventional, mm -hmm. um, are they going to lose that? You know, I think about my children and, um, you know, they're very uh, adept at the electronics at, you know, kind of um, multitasking and doing that. And so I could see this generation in the future being very reliant on the um, digital equipment, because that's going to be what they know and, and how they learn. And um, I think that the challenge is not to use, lose those basic flying uh, skills to be able to use the rudimentary instruments to continue to either keep the airplane flying or land it safely. So um, do you think our recommendations will not just get to proficiency with the glass cockpit issues, but maybe retention of um, some basic skills too? I think, in fact, that you're right, that you not only have, you don't necessarily want to train to um, not include glass over the conventional. It's in addition to, because you should continue to understand, as long as those uh, instruments are used in the aircraft, you almost have to understand both of them. Right. Chairman Herzman, if I could add uh, to your concern regarding um, failures in the glass cockpit, for these pilots and the need to rely on, uh, you know, conventional backup instruments. Uh, these are some of the things that we're looking at in each specific accident. And uh, uh, the, uh, it is a lower uh, standard for the certification and design for these uh, piston-powered glass cockpit less than 6,000 pounds, you know. Is 10 to the minus 3 a, a, an acceptable uh, target? 
when you've got a pilot that loses their all their electronic information and now has to suddenly and quickly get on the backup instruments to keep the 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 wings level these are some of the issues that we're looking into in in these in these cases and we're looking at FAA advisory guidance advisory circulars 23 1309 23 1311 FAA part 21 that requires manufacturers to report defects a lot of these equipment have commercial off-the-shelf hardware in other words they're not manufactured like part 25 equipment strictly for aircraft some are manufactured for other applications in 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 the industry so these are things that the Office of Aviation Safety is looking at in concert with RE and I think it's beyond the scope of this specific study but rest assured that we're we're tracking those issues very good thank you very much number some all vice chairman Hart at this time we'll move to the conclusions and recommendations unless the staff have any additional comments dr. Meyer will you please read the findings of the safety study and if any board member has any questions or comments please let me know after all of the findings are read finding number one study analyses of aircraft accident and activity data should a decrease in total accident rates but an increase in fatal accident rates for the selected group of glass cockpit aircraft when compared to similar conventionally equipped aircraft during the study period overall study analyses did not show a significant improvement in safety for the glass cockpit study group to pilots must be able to demonstrate a minimum knowledge of primary aircraft flight instruments and displays in order to be prepared to safely operate aircraft equipped with those systems which is necessary for all aircraft but is not currently addressed by Federal Aviation Administration knowledge tests for glass cockpit displays three pilots are not always provided all of the information necessary to adequately understand the unique operational and functional details of the primary flight instruments in their airplanes for generalized guidance and training are no longer sufficient to prepare pilots to safely operate glass cockpit avionics effect effective pilot instruction and evaluation must be tailored to specific equipment five simulators or procedural trainers are the most practical art alternative means of training pilots to identify and respond to glass cockpit avionics failures and malfunctions that cannot be easily or safely replicated in light aircraft six identification and tracking of service difficulties equipment malfunctions or failures abnormal operations or other safety issues will increase it will be increasingly important as light aircraft avionics systems and equipment continue to increase in complexity and variation of design and current reporting to the Federal Aviation Administration service difficulty reporting system does not adequately capture this information for 14 Code of Federal Regulations part 23 certified aircraft used in general aviation operations seven the Federal Aviation Administration's current review of the 14 Code of Federal Regulations part 23 certification process provides an opportunity to improve upon deficiencies in the reporting of equipment malfunctions and defects identified by the FAA and aviation industry representatives in the July 2009 part 23 certification process study report and finally number eight some glass cockpit displays include recording capabilities that have significantly benefited accident investigations and provide the general aviation community with the ability to improve equipment reliability and the safety and efficiency of aircraft operations through data analysis is there any discussion is there a motion to adopt the findings as proposed by the staff so moved. all in favor signal with a hand and aye the findings have been adopted dr. Meyer will you now read the safety recommendations and again if any board members have any comments please let me know after he's finished reading all of them how's your throat do you want to pass off the no, I'm good okay. uh, we're proposing six recommendations to the Federal Aviation Administration 
number one revise your men knowledge test to include questions regarding electronic flight and navigation displays including normal operations limitations and the interpretation of malfunctions and aircraft attitudes to require all manufacturers of certified electronic primary flight displays to include information in their approved aircraft flight manual and pilots operating handbook supplements regarding abnormal equipment operation or malfunction due to subsystem and input malfunctions including but not limited to pilot pedo and or static system blockages magnetic sensor malfunctions and attitude heading reference system alignment failures three Incorporate training elements regarding electronic primary flight displays into Federal Aviation Administration training materials and aeronautical knowledge requirements for all pilots. Four, incorporate equipment-specific training elements regarding electronic primary flight displays into its initial and recurrent flight proficiency requirements for pilots of 14 Code of Federal Regulations Part 23 certified aircraft equipment with those system, equipped with those systems. Number five, develop and publish guidance for the use of equipment-specific electronic avionics display simulators and procedural trainers that do not meet the definition of flight simulation training devices prescribed in 14 Code of Federal Regulations Part 60 to support equipment-specific pilot training requirements. I believe what we're hearing in the background is a car alarm and is not a fire alarm that's associated with this, uh, this facility. There we go. The last recommendation is number six, inform aircraft avionics maintenance technicians about the critical role of voluntary service difficulty reporting system reports involving malfunctions or defects associated with electronic primary flight, navigation, and control systems in 14 Code of Federal Regulations Part 23 certified aircraft used in general aviation operations. I noted that the managing director caught the uh, uh, pilot blockage is really a pedo blockage and so we'll reflect that uh, typographical error in the uh, second recommendation as corrected. Um, is there any discussion? A motion uh, to adopt the recommendations as maybe, revised. Maybe I misunderstood then I guess I'll make a motion in order to have some discussion because I do have some discussion. Sure. sure. Uh, go ahead. The fourth recommendation, uh, this goes to my point about the insurance companies. I'm not sure how that would work about incorporating equipment-specific training elements regarding electronic primary flight displays, flight displays. So does that mean if I go out and get my license in, a, in an airplane that has a Garmin 1000 in it, then my license will now say that I am licensed to fly airplanes with Garmin 1000 software 1.03 or, or, you know, I, I'm just, I, I don't understand how the, how that equipment specific training would work and I guess I'm thinking that uh, I'm, I'm wondering whether there are sort of um, let's call it modes of displays or modes of operation that could be trained to as opposed to equipment specific because as I mentioned before there's so many types of equipment and then the equipment itself changes with each up upgrade in the software because when I flew the Garmin 1000 the first time it didn't have the synthetic vision that it has in it now that I'm flying now so would I have had to get, you know, a new, a new endorsement in my license or something in order to fly with the synthetic vision when I already? So these are some of the questions I have. I'm just not sure how. I, I like the equipment-specific idea, but I think it's much more appropriate for insurance company engagement or some some other more flexible, uh, more surgical response than regulatory engagement by the FAA. So that that's my issue about the fourth one. Staff comments? I think one of the reasons why we were not prescriptive in exactly uh, how we would, would ask that that be done, I think, is recognizing that it would not be possible to say, you know, software revision X, but that perhaps there be an explicit statement that as part of the training requirements to document that they have received training in the in the malfunction modes and, and the operation and design of that equipment and that for noting it in the recurrent training that again to explicitly state that they 
for the aircraft that they're operating that they receive that specific training and, and document it. Well, perhaps a more appropriate recommendation, since this is a recommendation to the FAA, would be to ask them to look at how to be more specific in, you know, and whether that includes the insurance community or not, I don't know. But I'm, to me, this is a, since it's a recommendation to the FAA, it looks like you're asking them to incorporate equipment specific training elements, and that to me suggests some, you know, practical training standard that mentions equipment specific elements. And I, I, I'm just confused with how this is really going to work in the real world. That's, that's what I'm, I'm not opposed to the equipment specific idea because I think that's essential, but I'm just wondering how the FAA can make this happen. I, I don't see them playing that role to make that response as surgical and as flexible as it needs to be. I think perhaps what the, the way the requirement may read would be to receive the training in the, with the equipment installed in the aircraft and then the, certainly in terms of providing the training or specifying what that training is, I think they would have to, um, they would have to rely on the manufacturers of those systems to provide that information and define what that is. That we would not, we would not expect the FAA to be the ones that both provide the information, th but and uh, and require the the uh, training, but instead to require to include a, s a statement in there that uh, that that would be explicitly uh, be required and, and logged in order to uh, as, as part of the training requirements. And Vice Chairman uh, Hart, I. My two observations on that recommendation, uh, the FAA has initial and recurrent flight proficiency requirements in the regs, and this recommendation calls for incorporating uh, training elements in those requirements. Uh, it doesn't really go into detail, but it just, uh, to me, it reads like we just want the FAA to recognize that uh, uh, that's looked at in their uh, rules for recurrency and initial flight training. And this, my second comment is about the uh, engaging the insurance co uh, corporations. That's, uh, that can be a bit challenging. I know in the helicopter EMS uh, recommendations that we issued, we did make a recommendation to uh, Centers for Medicaid, Medicare, but they were really the, uh, a major government player in insurance rates, uh, whereas in the general aviation community, you've got a, a myriad of, of different insurance companies that are all doing business differently and they would uh, probably say that we're, the market will bear what kinds of requirements we're going to put on our customers uh, for insurance. So it's not as clean with the insurance companies, uh, in my view, as, as you might be thinking. But those are just my two comments on that in that regard. Member Samuel. Well, I do believe in looking for innovative ways to inspire change, and, uh, and Mr. Gazzetti is, is right. When we came down to issuing the recommendations to the Center for Medicare and Medicaid on the HEMS, there's a difference. One, one is somebody is providing insurance for transportation. The other is, is underwriting a loss, a potential loss. And so I view that differently. Medicare is paying those dollars one way or the other. What the underwriters are trying to do is minimize the loss, and they are strictly in the business to make a profit. And so I think that they are, I, although I have been disappointed in the past that the insurance underwriters have not taken a more aggressive stance in trying to uh, do things to actively improve safety, I think here is a case where they really do have a dog in the fight. And so they are looking at their risk and then underwriting those risks accordingly. So uh, I think they are trying to do whatever it's going to do to protect their bottom lines. Vice Chairman Hart, do you have any other comments? No, I think I, I guess I'd like to end up with having the – when I read this recommendation, literally it incorporate the specific training elements in the recurrent – initial and recurrent flight proficiency requirements. So that – makes me think I'm going to pick up a P, apply it, practical test standard booklet, which then is a regulatory document, by the way. It has to, it's changed by regulation, I guess. I think that's how it works. And I, I just don't, I, I just like to, I just like to have this recommendation be written in a way that asks the FAA to 
work with whoever it needs to work with collaboratively. Maybe that's the insurance community. I think Jeff Gazzetti has some good points. Maybe it's not. I don't know. But I, I think they need to explore how to respond to this reality that things are changing rapidly and substantially, and, and how, are, how are they going to keep up with that in keeping the system, keeping from having those changes degrade the safety of the system. That, I'm, I'm just trying to figure out a way to do that because the way it's written now does not, it, it is much too specific in terms of what the FAA has to do, and, and I just don't understand how that would really work. I think staff would need a few minutes to, to confer to see if we can uh, propose something different if, uh, I, if that's what's desired. I think one of, I think one of the things that um, might be important to note here is that often we make recommendations uh, to the FAA in which they come back to us with alternatives about what can be accomplished. And so um, I recognize that um, changing um, 14 CFR Part 23 um, or required training elements into regulations might not be as dynamic uh, as what uh, insurance industry might be able to do. I, I think that um, uh, the training elements might change uh, over time as technology changes. And so I recognize the issues that the vice chairman's raising, but I think that our recommendation to the FAA is really the opener for this conversation and to tell them you know, look, you've got this issue, you've got all of this new equipment, you need to figure out how to get people trained on the equipment. And it is their prerogative to come back to us with some alternative approach uh, that uh, may not be a regulatory uh, approach. Um, so I think that we have some flexibility as far as how FAA can respond. And I think we do also have the potential to pursue the issue that the vice chairman raises uh, in the future. Um, Mr. Marcus, I was wondering if we've ever issued recommendations to the insurance industry in the past to try to get at a safety concern. I'm, I'm not aware of any uh, aviation recommendations issued to the insurance industry uh, regarding safety issues. Okay. Well, I can tell you that I've, I've sat with different groups, and I know that probably Member Sumwalt has two um, different associations that often have on their corporate boards um, different members, and many of them are in the insurance industry, and I've uh, had the opportunity to meet with them on various occasions. I think that what this document does is it helps give a roadmap to the insurance industry for the requirements that they may want to pursue, and so it it does give them a platform, and I can tell you in other modes in particular, um, I'm thinking about um, the trucking industry. I can talk about some cases very recently where we've seen some very aggressive action on some medical issues that have not been federal requirements. And so um, I think that this could serve the industry by helping the insurance industry uh, justify and validate uh, the requirements that they might want to put forward, even in the absence of regulation. So um, perhaps the staff can continue uh, to look at ways that we might engage with other industries as appropriate, um, including the insurance industry in the future. Any other comments? No, I think those are, those are very well taken comments. So certainly, with respect to the manner in which the FAA sets um, proficiency requirements for aircraft uh, in receiving a recommendation like this, the FAA would, would certainly be at, at liberty if it finds that its, its processes are not nimble enough to keep up with the, the current uh, influx of glass aircraft uh, in the, the current general aviation fleet. Certainly the FAA would be at liberty to propose different, different methods uh, of compliance with this recommendation or, or perhaps it would be their prerogative to, to adjust the ways in which they set proficiency requirements and, and if they wish to, to, uh, to, to partner with outside entities that might have an interest in this, uh, certainly we would be able to consider that as alternative action uh, in, in, in judging their response to the recommendation. Dr. Groff, you also mentioned, I thought, in your presentation that the insurance industry is already doing some of this, that some, uh, some training uh, for certain um, providers is required. Well, in general, anytime uh, 
to get insurance uh, coverage, in most cases, if you buy a new aircraft, you're, you're going to have to get a certain amount of training in that in that aircraft. One of the things we found is that they they may or may not even know the displays that are in the aircraft, uh, particularly in the case of a retrofit. They they may not they may or may not know that if you would if you were to upgrade them. So. Um, with regard specifically to this, the displays, I think in more ca the more likely cases they go by the airframe itself mm -hmm. than the, than the uh, avionics. But perhaps now uh, they will be asking Maybe. and looking for that information as far as their uh, um, valuation of the uh, of the aircraft, mm -hmm. the policy. Vice Chairman, do you have some additional comments, or are we ready to call the question? I didn't understand if staff was looking at doing some language revision on that. Well, I propose that we need a motion. Uh, Vice Chairman, do you have some some language in mind? I'm writing some as we speak, so it'll take me a few minutes. Thank you. The, the concepts I have in mind are, and this isn't the specific language, but the concepts I have in mind, I mean, because I, I fundamentally agree with the need for equipment-specific training. So the concepts I have in mind are for the FAA to work collaboratively with other aspects of the industry to help assure that, that pilots more effectively receive, pilots of Part 123 aircraft more effectively receive in equipment-specific training. So that, that's the direction I'm headed. That's obviously a lot softer than this, but that's the direction that I'm headed. I'm suggesting that as it's worded, it's not really workable in the real world, and I'm reluctant to send a recommendation that we know when we send it is not really workable in the real world. I'd be glad to second something if I if I had a motion. Does staff any, have any suggested language, or do you want me to read something? In, in all candor, I'm not sure that we're down here as, as, as clear as we could be on, on exactly what we're trying to do to improve on this recommendation. I mean, I think we, we, we don't disagree with you that, 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 that this would require some, some effort on the part of the FAA to figure out how to actually bring about the change that we're asking for. Um, and we, we certainly could find a place in here, I think, uh, if given a moment to, to add a concept of, you know, collaborating more appropriately with other aspects of the aviation industry. Um, but I, I, I don't know that down here we're, we're fully aware of what, what aspect you're trying to improve on, so I'm a little concerned we might miss the mark. The specific concern is that, to me, incorporate equipment-specific training elements in the in initial and recurrent flight proficiency requirements suggests that we're asking them to create a piece of paper like the practical test standard that says you must be trained in the specific equipment that you're going to fly. So that means when you get your license, your license is going to say your license is endorsed to fly Garmin 1000 
version 1.06. If you want fly version 1.07, you need to get another endorsement on your license. And that's to me, is not a workable solution. And I know that's not what you intend, but that's the way I think this recommendation is, can easily be read. Something like explore means of working collaboratively with, collaboratively with other segments of the industry, including the insurance industry, to help assure that pilots of 14 CFR Part 133 certified aircraft equipped with those systems receive more effectively receive equipment-specific training or something like that. Madam Chairman, may I make a suggestion, please? I don't think it's fair for staff to be put in the position of drafting the wording. It's the Vice Chairman that has a concept, and, and I think so that we get it just right, it'd be better that he come up with the wording. So uh, um, perhaps the best way to do that would be to pause just for a brief moment, and, and, and I'll, I think we need a motion at this point. We can't rely on staff to draft the motion for a member. Staff has already put forward their best effort of this report. Yeah, I wasn't, I wasn't intending to rely on staff. I just asked them, did they have any ideas? I, I'll do some language. I'm happy to do that. That's what lawyers do. But I just wanted to see if you had any language. At this time, we don't have any specific language. Okay, let's take a five-minute break uh, and give uh, the Vice Chairman a few minutes to put his thoughts together so that we can get a motion to vote on, and uh, we'll reconvene at 12.15. Is there any further uh, discussion uh, before we uh, take a vote? The staff have worked on a, a potential substitute recommendation, and I think uh, um, Dr. Colley is going to read it to see if uh, the board believes that this better addresses what we were trying to get at or, or not. If I could insert on process, I believe what staff is proposing is a uh, is language to capture the vice chairman's intent if it accurately captures his intent he can make a motion that it be considered and if seconded and voted it would be adopted but until that point it would not be the uh, decision of the board dr colley can you please when you read it read it slowly for those of us who haven't heard it yet yes incorporate training elements regarding electronic primary flight displays all right sorry you just struck equipment specific yes okay I'll start from the top again incorporate training elements regarding electronic primary flight displays into its initial and recurrent flight proficiency requirements for pilots of 14 Code of Federal Regulations Part 23 certified aircraft equipped with those systems, comma, that address variations in equipment design and operations of such displays. Could you read so, after the comma again? Right. After the comma, it says that address variations in equipment design and operations of such displays. And how does this get to the insurance issue? We were not specifically addressing the issue with regard to insurance, but we were trying to address the vice chairman's concern about 
there being uh, a, a, a call for equipment specific training that he felt that was not appropriate for uh, for this particular recommendation. My insurance suggestion was just a way to try to address these variations, but I think their language has accomplished that, and whether the FA wants to bring the insurance community into that or not would be up to them or other very other aspects of the industry, how, however they want to do it. But the point is to, I think this accommodates the need to address the variations in equipment design without suggesting that, that your license is going to say, I have now been gotten my private license in a Diamond DA40 with Garmin 1000 version 1.07. I, that, that language addresses the concern that I raised, and thank you for writing it for me. Does, does the, is the language still require the FA to incorporate something into initial and recurrent training? Yes, we're, we're asking them to do to to incorporate these elements. So instead of saying incorporate equipment specific training elements, we're saying incorporate training elements that address variations in equipment design and the operation of such displays. And I think the intent the intent was to broaden what what we were asking the FAA to incorporate. There were there have been discussions with the vice chairman about the fact that these these equipment can change it's the potential for this type of equipment to change specifically the software so rapidly and so so uh, specifically that uh, he he was looking to uh, address this in a more broader fashion to to uh, look at glass cockpit te technology in a general more general sense but not to the very specific variation that was that was the way we understood his his request you understood that correctly. Another variation on that theme would be just as you have a tail dragger endorsement and you have a complex aircraft endorsement, you could have a glass cockpit endorsement. So this kind of heads in that direction without specifically saying an endorsement. But, I mean, that's the, that's the idea is to train you in the, this equipment to the extent it varies from what, you're, what you've been tested in and what you're going to see, but you still understand the, the broad parameters of the way this stuff works kind of thing. And I think you have... Your language. We we had that. envisioned in our in our memo back uh, on the original comment. We had envisioned that it would that that our original recommendation, in fact, would not be so prescriptive and so specific, but but would just in in fact address general concepts because currently uh, there is a void in, in 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 any of this type of training in in both initial and recurrent. I'm ready to make a motion in that case. And my, my, move, my motion would be to adopt these recommendations as with the fourth one as revised. I, I'll second that, but I'd like to hear it read just from top to bottom one more time. But, uh, but, but, but I, uh, let's hear it one more time, Madam Chairman, if that's okay, and then I'll, uh, I'll second. And just for the simplicity of reading, just to let you know that it's the same recommendation you now have with the two words equipment specific in the first line struck and then an additional phrase on the end of it. I understand. Thanks. And uh, I, I, I think that's good. And I think for everyone watching, it, uh, it doesn't necessarily have the written version with the scratch throughs and the additions. It would be good just to hear it one more time. Thank you. Incorporate training elements regarding electronic primary flight displays into its initial and recurrent flight proficiency requirements for pilots of 14 code of regulation part 23 certified aircraft equipped with those systems that address variations in equipment design and operations of such displays and and as mentioned i do second that motion any additional discussion All in favor, signal with a hand and aye. 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 The ayes have it. The recommendation has been uh, adopted as revised. Is there a motion to adopt all of the recommendations? As, as amended? As, as revised, yes. Mm -hmm. I so moved. Second. All in favor, signal with a hand and aye. 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 The ayes have it. 
Um, we will now vote on adopting the report in whole. Um, uh, before we do that, I do want to thank Ms. Bennett, who was the writer uh, of this report. Oftentimes, uh, uh, we do forget to take our hat off to the people who actually put the product together. So um, uh, Sally Bennett uh, was uh, instrumental in getting this completed. Thank you for your hard work. Is there a motion to adopt the report as revised? So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. The ayes have it. The report has been adopted. Is there any interest in filing a concurring or dissenting uh, statement appended to the study? None. Seeing none, um, are there any closing comments by my colleagues? None? I would just to say, like to say thanks to the staff for a job well done. I think this is an issue that needs to be looked at, and you did a very, you did a very good look at it, and I'm looking forward to where this can take us as a flyer of these kinds of airplanes. Myself, I think it's essential uh, to, to have, have to do what you're saying, and I thank you for doing it. The study adopted by the, by the board today is an important step towards realizing the full safety benefits of glass cockpits in light aircraft. Our discussion today highlights the dramatic changes this evolving technology presents to pilots, regulators, industry, and the general aviation community. While this technology creates enormous opportunities by increasing the types and amount of information that's available to pilots, which has the potential to improve safety, it also brings with it challenges due to its complexity and rapid development. Today, nearly all newly manufactured piston-powered light airplanes are equipped with digital primary flight displays. This is a marked change from a decade or even just five years ago. As the number of older airplanes uh, being retrofitted, this number is going to increase. While the technological innovations and flight management tools that glass cockpit equipped airplanes bring to the general aviation community should reduce the number of fatal accidents, we have not unfortunately seen that borne out in the data. Glass cockpits are both complex and they vary from aircraft to aircraft in function, design, and failure modes. To maximize the safety potential of this technology, we must give the pilots the information that they need to understand the unique operational and functional details of the technology specific to their aircraft. As we discussed today, training is clearly one of the key components to reducing the accident rate of light planes equipped with glass cockpits, and this study clearly demonstrates the life and death importance of appropriate training on these complex systems. We know that while many pilots have thousands of hours of experience with conventional flight instruments, that alone is not enough to prepare them to safely operate airplanes equipped with these glass cockpit uh, features. The data tell us that equi equipment specific training will save lives. So to that end, we've adopted recommendations today that are responsive to the data. Recommendations on pilot knowledge, testing standards, training, simulators, documentation, and service difficulty reporting so that potential safety improvements that these systems provide can be realized by the general aviation community. This meeting is adjourned.